Hello and welcome to the pool party you'll never forget. Today, I will show you how I managed to find new process injection techniques that are fully undetectable, and they all abuse a legitimate Windows component, which is the Windows user mode threat pool. My name is Alon Levayev, and I'm a security researcher at SafeBridge. I'm 21 years old and mainly self-taught. My main interests and focus include operating system internals, reverse engineering, and vulnerability research. And before joining the security field, I was a professional Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu athlete, where I won several world and European titles. So this is what we'll be talking about today. First up, we'll start with some research background, followed by research motivation and research goals. Next, I'll take you behind the scenes of the research process and we'll deep dive into the internals of the Windows user mode threat pool, followed by an introduction to the pool party tool. And I'll sum up with the research implications and takeaways. So for those of you who does not know, process injection is an evasion technique used to execute arbitrary code in a target process. It usually consists a chain of three primitives. The first one would be an allocation primitive used to allocate memory on the target process. The second primitive would be a writing primitive used to write memory, malicious, mem malicious shellcode, to the previously allocated memory. And the third primitive would be the execution primitive used to execute the, um, the malicious code written. Now, the most basic primitives would be virtual alloc X API for allocation, the write process memory API for writing, and create remote thread API for execution. This injection technique, so-called create remote thread injection, is very simple and powerful, but there is only one downside. It is detectable by all modern EDRs. This research aims to discover new process injection techniques that are fully undetectable. Now, we all know the risk of process injections. It can lead to serious evasive attacks, making malicious actions become completely legitimate. Using process injections, we can probably perform meaningful attacks such as credential dumping or even a ransomware, all while staying untouched. And this is exactly what I managed to do, and I promise you that I'll show you how. So the motivation for this research was derived from the fact that process injection techniques abuse legitimate features of the operating system. I wondered, can an EDR effectively distinguish legitimate versus malicious use of a feature? I also wondered, is the current detection approach generic enough to detect new and never before seen process injections? So to answer these questions, I've had to review the current detection approach employed by EDRs against process injections. And experimenting with the different primitives led me to the conclusions that EDR based their detection mainly on the execution primitive. On top of that, write and allocate primitives on their most basic forms are not detected. And as I mentioned in the motivation for this research, I wanted to understand how EDRs distinguish legitimate and malicious use of a feature. So taking thread creation as an example, EDRs would not usually allow a process to create a thread for another process. Another example for a similar approach by EDRs would be detecting a synchronous procedure call injection. And I noticed that EDRs will not usually allow an APC to be queued to a thread belonging to processes other than the current process. So in summary, Allocate and write primitives on their most basic forms are not detected. The detection is based mainly on the execution primitive, and the execution primitives are detected based on comparing the initiator versus the creator of an action. So with better understanding of the detection approach, I could define the research goals. And my ultimate goal was to find new and fully undetectable process injection techniques and I wanted it to be applicable against all Windows processes, no prerequisites whatsoever. Based on the detection approach lessons learned, we know that writing and allocation primitives are not detected. So what if we created an execution primitive that is based only on writing and allocation primitives? Furthermore, what if the execution is triggered by legitimate action? What if I told you that writing to an innocent file in the system could trigger shellcode in a target process? So while searching for a suitable component that will help me in achieving my research goals, I came across the Windows user mode thread pool. And before I explain why the thread pool ended up being the perfect target, you may wonder what even is a thread pool. So to explain what is a thread pool, I'll use a simple metaphor. Imagine that you have a pile of boxes that needs to be mailed. Now mailing each box individually can take a lot of time and effort. 
But what if you could send boxes in parallel? So to speed things up, you decide to create a team of deliverymen. And those deliverymen are responsible for taking boxes from the pile of boxes and deliver them. So in the world of computers, this parallelism is what we call a thread pool. And the thread pool pile of boxes is called a work queue. And each box in the pile of boxes is called a work item. Now, the thread pool's delivery mans are called worker threads. And the goal of those worker threads is to dequeue work, work items from the work queue and execute it. So now that we understand what a thread pool is, let me tell you why I choose the thread pool as my target. So first, all Windows processes have a thread pool by default, which ensures that if I find new process injection techniques, they will be applicable against all Windows processes. In addition, work items and thread pools are represented by structures, which increases the possibility of having an execution primitive based only on allocation and writing. And third, multiple work item types are supported, which means that we have more opportunities, and generally, it increases the attack surface. So with that in mind, let's take a swim in the thread pool, starting from its architecture. So the thread pool comprises three distinct work queues, and each work queue is dedicated for a different type of work item. And you can see the queues on the left side of the diagram. The queues include a task queue, a timer queue, and an IO completion queue residing in the kernel. The worker threads on the right side of the diagram are operating on the different queues to dequeue work items and execute them. Now, lastly, the thread, pool, the thread pool contains a worker threads manager, which is responsible for managing the worker threads. And this is the worker factory object you can see um, on the bottom. Now, do not bother with memorizing each part of this architecture, as we'll go over the relevant parts later on. Now, in regards of attack surface, we have the different work queues, and we know that an insertion of a valid work item into one of these queues will result in the work item to execute. Other than the queues, the worker threads, the worker factor which serves, serves as the worker threads manager may be used to take over the worker threads. Now, just before we move on to uh, explore each component in the attack surface, I would like to introduce you to the pool party. The pool party is an exclusive party that I will use to gather all the injection techniques that I find. Now, you can notice that the party is now empty, but do not be intimidated by the emptiness of the party, as I promise you that I'll do my best to recruit new friends to the party as we move along. So let's start from attacking the worker threads manager, so-called a worker factory. So worker factory is a Windows object responsible for managing thread pool worker threads. If we use the delivery man manager, um, a delivery man metaphor that, that we used before, the worker factory is the same as the delivery man manager. So in case a delivery man did not send any box for like an hour, the manager would probably send him home. So similarly, the worker factory manages the worker threads by monitoring active or blocking worker threads. And based on the monitoring results, it creates or terminates worker threads. Now, the worker factory does not perform any scheduling or execution of work items on its own. Its only purpose is to make sure that the number of worker threads is sufficient. The kernel exposes view system calls to interact with worker factory objects. Among them, we have a create and shutdown system call, query and set, which are basically a getter and setter for the kernel object. And we have a ready, wait, and release system calls. With the goal of taking over worker threads, the relevant target would be the start routine. And the start routine is basically the entry point of the worker threads. Usually, this routine serves as the thread pool scheduler, responsible for dequeuing and executing work items. Now, the start routine can be controlled in the worker factory creation system call. And more interestingly, it accepts a handle to the process of which to create the worker factory for. At first look, it sounds promising. Can we just create a worker factory on a target process and have its start routine point to a malicious shellcode? So the answer is no. Trying to create a worker factory for another process fails due to an incorrect parameter. So looking at the implementation of the system call in the kernel, I noticed that there is a validation that makes sure no worker factories are created for processes other than the current process. And generally speaking, it is a bit odd that the system call accepts a parameter with only one possible value. However, let's move on to explore other alternatives that can lead to abusing the start routine. 
So going back to one of the main reasons that we choose the thread pool as our target was since all Windows processes have a thread pool by default, and consequentially, a worker factory object by default. So instead of going through the trouble of um, creating a worker factory for a target process, we can simply utilize the duplicate handle API to gain access to an existing worker factory object belonging to the target process. Now, given access to an existing worker factory does not let us control the start within pointer, as this pointer is constant and cannot be naturally changed after the object was initialized. With that said, if we can somehow determine the start routine value, we can overwrite the routine code with our malicious shellcode. So to get worker factory information, the query system will can be used. And it accepts a worker factory handle, an information class stating which information to retrieve, and a buffer which the retrieved information will be written to. Now, the only information class supported by the query system call is an information class retrieving basic information on the worker factory. In this case, this is enough, as the basic information include the start routine pointer that we are targeting. Now, given the start routine pointer, we can override the start routine contents with a malicious shellcode. And this, um, the, the start routine is guaranteed to run at some point, but it would be even better if we could trigger its execution instead of just waiting for it. Now, the ideal spot to examine is the set system call, allowing us to modify worker factory attributes. The set system call <clears throat> is quite similar to the query system call. This time, the buffer is an input buffer and not an output buffer. The set system call also supports a little more information classes than the query system call. And the information class that suits our needs the best is the worker factory thread minimum, which sets the, sets the minimum running worker threads of the worker factory. So having um, two worker threads currently running Setting the minimum worker threads number to be the current running threads number plus one will essentially result in a new worker thread to be created, meaning that the start routine that we are targeting will get executed. So with that, let me show you the first brand new and fully undetectable process injection technique of the day. So we'll start off by getting the handle table of the target process, and we'll use antiquary information um, system call um, to do it. We'll then iterate over the handle table to locate the worker factory handle. Once we find the worker factory handle, we would duplicate it. Given access to the worker factory of the target process, we query basic information from the worker factory. And using the information obtained, which includes the start routine, we will write shellcode to the start routine of the worker factory. So now all that is left to do is to trigger the malicious, um, the malicious uh, start routine. And in order to do that, we will set the minimum um, worker threads number. So we now have our first friend in the pool party. But we do not want to leave this friend all alone in the pool. So let's move on to explore the thread pool queues. Maybe we can recruit new friends to the party. So when attacking the thread pool, my goal was to insert a work item to a target process. I knew that a correctly inserted work item will get executed by the worker thread at one point or another. So my goal um, was to, my focus was um, on how work items are inserted into the different thread pool queues. Now, I also assumed that I have access to the worker factory object um, that the target thread pool uses, as we just proved that such access can be granted by duplicating the handle. So the thread pool supports multiple types of work items, and they could be divided into three. The regular work items, which are queued right away by the queuing API call. The asynchronous work items, which are queued based on operation completion, for example, when a write file operation was completed. And the timer work items, which are queued right away by the queuing API call, but are executed once the timer expires. So the timer work items are kind of a combination of both asynchronous um, and regular work items. Now, as for the three types of work items, we also have three queues. The regular work items are queued into the task queue residing in the main REPL structure, which is called the TP pool. The asynchronous work items are queued to the IO completion queue, which is actually a Windows object that we will we'll discuss later on. And the timer work items are queued to the timer queue, also residing in the main thread pool structure. Before we dive into the queuing mechanism of each work item type, 
it is important to note that the work item callbacks are not executed directly. Instead, each work item has a helper callback that is used to execute the work item callback. The structure that is queued to the queue is the helper structure. So keep that in mind as we analyze the work item's queuing mechanism. And let's start with the regular work item, the TP work. By looking closely at the work item structure, I found its helper part called the task structure. So now we know that the task structure is what gets put in the task queue of the thread pool. But here's the real question. How does it get there? So the API responsible for posting a task to the thread pool's task queue is the TP post task API. The thread pool task queue is a double linked list of tasks. So consider that we have a queue of three tasks. Calling the post task API on this queue will result in the task to be queued to the end of the queue, as you can see on the monitor. So given the thread pool structure of the target process, we can temper with its task queue to inject malicious task into it. And with that, let me show you the second brand new and fully undetectable process injection technique of the day. So similar to the first variant, we start by getting the handle table of the target process. We iterate over the table once we find the worker factory handle, and once we, once we find it, we duplicate it. Then we query basic information from the worker factory. And notice that this time, we do not need the start within, we need the start parameter. The start parameter is the pointer to the main thread pool structure. Then we read the, th the thread pool structure from the target process, and we do it in order to obtain the target task queue. We proceed by creating a malicious work item that its callback points to a shellcode. Then we allocate memory for the malicious work item on the target process. And following the allocation, we write the work item to the um, target process. Now we can notice that the work item and the task queue are not currently connected. So our next step would be to use any writing primitive to insert the malicious work item to the thread pool. And this step essentially manipulates the task queue in a way that it will have a new work item in its head. As a result, the scheduler will dequeue the malicious work item and execute it. So please welcome in our second friend in the pool party. And I was pleased to have two friends in the party, but it is not a real party without at least five to ten friends. So let's move on to attack asynchronous work items, and hopefully we can recruit them to the party as well. Asynchronous work items are associated with a Windows object, and they are executed asynchronously once an operation on the object was completed. All of these work items are queued to the I.O. completion queue. So before we dive into how asynchronous work items are queued, let me first explain what the I.O. completion queue is. So the completion queue is a Windows object that serves as a queue for completed I.O. operations. Notifications are inserted into the queue once an I.O. operation completes. So you can see the queue on the left side of the diagram, and once uh, you can see the, sorry, the I.O. operation, and once the I.O. operation on the left side is completed, a notification is queued to the queue on the right side. Now, the thread pool relies on the completion queue to receive notification when an asynchronous work items operation is completed. The kernel exposes few system calls to interact with um, completion queues, have um, the create system call to create a queue, an open system call to open an existing queue. We also have a query and set system calls, which are, again, getter and setter for the kernel object. And we have a remove system call used to remove an entry from the queue. Now, keep in mind the set system call, which is used to queue a notification to the queue. We will get back to the system call later on. Equipped with some uh, better understanding of file completion queues, let's jump right into the queuing mechanism of the asynchronous work items. I'll use the TPIO work item as an example, but note that the same concepts apply to the other asynchronous work items as well. They're all queued in a very similar manner. So the TPIO work item is a work item that is intended to execute on completion of file operations, such as read and write. The helper of the TPIO work item is the direct structure. So we expect this structure to be um, queued into the completion queue. The function that's res responsible for associating the work items file with the completion queue is the tp bind file to direct function. 
And this function sets the file completion queue to be the thread pool's completion queue, and the file completion key to be the direct structure, which is the helper structure. So consider that we have a helper, uh, sorry, so that we have a file object without a defined queue and an empty key. And you can see the file object illustration on the left. And we also have an empty completion queue object, which you can see on the right. Calling the tp bind file to direct function will result in the completion queue of the file object pointing to the thread pool's completion queue and the completion key pointing to the direct structure. Now at that point, you will notice that the completion queue is still empty, as no operation on the file occurred yet. Any operation on the file following the function call, for example, write file, would cause the completion key to be queued to the completion queue. So you can see that the notification was queued to the queue as a result of the write file operation. So to conclude, asynchronous work items are queued to the completion queue, and the direct structure is the field that is queued. Having a handle to the completion queue of the target process gives us the ability to queue notifications to it. So with that, let me show you the third brand new and fully undetectable process injection technique of the day. We'd start off by getting the handle table of the target process. We then iterate over the table and we duplicate the IO completion handle of the target thread pool. Notice that this time we do not need the worker factory object. We then create an innocent file on the system. And following the file creation, we create a malicious TPIO work item. We then allocate memory for the work item on the target process. And following the allocation, we write the malicious work item to the target process. And at that point, you will notice that the malicious work item is not associated with the completion queue. So next, we use the set anti set information file system call to associate the innocent file that we've just created with the target thread pool's completion queue. We also set the completion key to point to the direct structure of the malicious work item that we have just written. Lastly, we write content to the innocent file we created, which causes the malicious work item to execute. So a completely legitimate action, such as writing to a file, caused a malicious code shellcode to get executed in a victim process. This capability is insane. Now, you may ask yourself how we also insert the other asynchronous work items, the job, ALPC, and wait work items. So basically, any TP direct notification queued to the completion queue will get executed. It is all a matter of how we queue the notification to the queue. We can achieve notification queuing in two ways. The first way would be um, very similar to the TPIO abuse we just showed. It will involve associating the Windows object with the completion queue of the target process and having the key pointing to the malicious work item. So then any operation on the object following the association will result in the malicious work item to execute. We can also use um, the anti set IO completion system call that we have mentioned earlier to queue notifications to the queue. Um, and this time, we do not need to proxy it through a Windows object. Basically, the moment that we call this API to queue notification, the malicious work item will execute. So please welcome in five new friends to the pool party. And our new friends include the four synchronous work items, the IO, LPC, wait, and the job work items. And it also contains a TP direct insertion done directly by the anti set IO completion system call. Now, our pool party is almost complete, but we've got one final work item that has not joined the fun yet. We do not want to neglect the timer, so let's see if we can recruit one last friend to the party. And bear with me for this one, because this one is even cooler than the last variants. You would not want to miss a variant that is able to trigger after the attacker already vanished from the system. So first, when looking at the timer work item creation and submission API, I noticed an interesting fact. No timer handle is supplied. We can see that the submission API set thread pull timer accepts some timer configurations such as due time and period, but where does the actual timer object reside? It turns out that the timer work items operate on an existing timer object which resides in the timer queue. 
And so once the submission API is called, the work item is inserted into the queue, and the timer object residing in the queue is configured accordingly, accordingly to the user supplied data. Then once the timer is expired, a dequeuing function is called, which dequeues the timer work item and executes it. Now, generally speaking, timers in Windows are not, they do not natively support callback execution in expiration. All you need to know about it is that the thread pool implements it by using the TP wait work item, which supports timers. So to conclude, if we set the timer residing in the queue to expire, the dequeuing function is called. Now, the question is, how do we correctly insert a timer to the queue? So the connectors between a timer and the timer queue are the Windows end links and Windows start links fields. For the sake of simplicity, you can think of these two fields as list entries of double linked list. The function that queues the timer to the queue is named TPP and timer, and it inserts the start links to the queue windows start field and the end links to the queue windows end field. So given a timer and an empty timer queue, calling the TPP and queue timer will result in the timer queue start and end to point to the start and end links of the timer work item, which you can see on the monitor. So the work item submission API is responsible for two things. One is to queue the timer work item to the timer queue, and two is to configure the timer object residing in the queue, to configure it um, accordingly to the user supply parameters. Now, as a result of these two actions, once the timer object expires, the dequeuing function executes, dequeuing and executing the work item. So with that, let me show you the last brand new and fully undetectable process injection technique of the day. We start off as usual by getting the handle table of the target process. We proceed by duplicating the worker factory handle and then we query basic information from the worker factory. Once we have the basic information, which includes um, the target thread pool pointer, we read um, the thread pool structure from the target process, and we do it in order to obtain the timer queue, the target timer queue, which you can see on the victim process. We proceed by creating a malicious work item, and then we allocate memory for the work item on the target process, and following the allocation, we are writing the malicious work item to the target process. Then we use any writing primitive to insert the malicious timer work item to the timer queue residing in the um, thread pool structure. So you can see that now um, the timer, the malicious timer, and the timer queue are connected because we just inserted the work item to the queue. So all that is left to do is to trigger the dequeuing function. And in order to do that, we, are getting, we first get the timer handle um, that the timer queue uses. We duplicate its handle. And then we set the timer to expire. And this is where all the magic happens. Once the timer expires, the malicious work item executes. Now, what's even more crazy about this variation is that after setting the timer, the attacker can exit the process and erase its identity from the system. As a result, the system appears clean. And only when the timer runs out, the malicious work item executes. You can set the timer to expire in one minute or in 10 hours. Eventually, it will execute. So did you ever think that the expiration of a timer will trigger a malicious, malicious shellcode in a target process? Me neither. So with that, please welcome in our last friend in the pool party. And with eight friends in the party, let me introduce you to the pool party tool for the first time ever. So pool party supports eight variants, starting from the start in abuse to the insertion of any work item that the thread pool supports. Pool party effectively bypasses Palo Alto Cortex, Sentinel-1, CrowdStrike EDR, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, and Cyber Reason. And these vendors are leaders on endpoint protection, according to Gardner's Magic Quadrant. Poolparty achieved 100% success rate, as none of the EDRs that I have tested was able to detect or prevent Poolparty attacks. Now, let me show you the first ever demo of Poolparty in action. So we'll start by making sure that the security solution is up and running. This time we're using um, CrowdStrike. 
We then locate the noted process, which we want to inject code into, and we use create mode thread, the known injection, to inject code into Notepad. You can see that the EDR detects it as malicious. So we proceed um, to use pool party, to introduce pool party. You can see it supports all of the eight variants. So we start by injecting code using variant one. The code we inject will spawn child process under Notepad. So you can see our attacker controlled child process under Notepad. So we proceed to the second variant, and the third variant, and the fourth variant, and so on. What's interesting here is that Notepad is running as usual. And, until, and once we finish um, the attack, you can see that we have eight child processes under Notepad without a single detection being raised. So to conclude a party, this is how we started. A pretty lame party, if you ask me. And this is how it is going right now. Much better, isn't it? Now, before we conclude the presentation, I promised you that I will show you how I managed to perform evasive credential dumping and ransomware attacks, all while staying untouched. So let me demonstrate how, by utilizing pool party attacks, I managed to dump the memory of the sensitive ELSAS process without a single detection being raised. So we start by making sure that the security solution is up and running. This time we're using Palo Alto Cortex. Then we locate the ELSAS PID, and we try to dump it using a known, um, a known method. You can see that uh, Palo Alto detects it as malicious, because by no means it is legitimate to dump the memory of ELSAS from an attacker-controlled process. But what if we could make ELSAS dump the memory of itself for us? So we go ahead and use pool party variant 7, but basically any variant could be used to inject code into ELSAS, making it dump the memory of itself for us. You can see that the dump file was created in the dumps folder. The WinDebug can help us take a look on the dump file. <clears throat> so if we use the analyze command on the dump file, you will see that it belongs to the ELSAS process. As you can see on the monitor, and such dump file can be further analyzed to extract credentials from it and other sensitive information. Another example of a feature that could be completely bypassed is Windows Defender's Control Folder Access feature. This feature is used to protect specific folders against ransomware attacks. So let me show you how, by utilizing pool party attacks, we can completely circumvent this feature, executing a non detectable ransomware attack. So we would start by making sure that Windows Defender is up and running, and also by making sure that the controlled folder access feature is enabled. You can see that it is enabled. And if we look at the protected folders, you can see that the, the, the documents folder is a protected folder. And if we go ahead and look at the contents of the documents folder, you can see some sensitive data, such as background checks and bank accounts, which um, looks tempting for an attacker to encrypt. So we use a normal ransomware to try and go ahead and encrypt the documents folder. And once we execute the ransomware, you can see that um, we're unable to access any file on the documents folder, and Windows Defender is not happy about our attempt. But what if we make a trusted process to do the encryption for us? So we try to inject code into Explorer, and you can see um, we're again using um, variant 5, but any variant could be used. We inject code that will encrypt the documents folder for us. You can see that once the attack was completed, all of the files in the documents folder are encrypted, and Windows Defender does not seem to mind. So what are the takeaways for this talk? First, although EDRs have evolved with the years, the current detection approach employed is not strong enough to generically detect new process injection techniques. The threat pool is not the last feature to be abused for process injections, and there is a need for a better and generic detection in, in place. Now, in addition, the impact of an undetectable process injection is larger than we thought. It is not only about being stealth and persistent anymore. Process injection could also be used for undetectable credential dumping and ransomware file encryptions, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Now, lastly, we need to enhance our focus on detecting anomalies rather than placing complete trust in processes based solely on their identity. This research just demonstrated that executing code on the behalf of a trusted process can go undetected. And this underscores the importance of analyzing the actions that such processes do. 
This is the QR code and link to the Pool Party GitHub repository. It is now public, and I encourage you to try it and test yourself. I will be taking questions in the hall, and also feel free to reach me out on social media. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining me today. I've had a lot of fun, and I hope you did too. Thank you.